we're going to start looking at electrochemistry. It might take a little while for you to see how electrochemistry ties into thermodynamics, but it does. This is an excellent example of a place where thermodynamics is easily applied. So just give it a little bit of time and then we'll see these two things get pulled together. Electrochemistry is the study of the interchange of chemical energy into electrical energy. So when we cause electricity to be produced from chemicals, this happens when electrons are exchanged between various species. So between atoms and ions or between compounds, we can separate these two species and get the electrons to move through a wire, thus producing electricity. So we can turn that chemical energy into electrical energy. We're going to start by focusing all the galvanic cells. Sometimes these are called voltaic cells. These are thermodynamically favorable. This is basically a battery. We have a redox reaction happening where we have separated the oxidation half reaction from the reduction half reaction, and we've connected those two um, containers with a wire. So the electrons have to move along the wire in order for this redox reaction to happen. And that's how we get the electricity to make this battery work. Let's look at a diagram that shows us what we're talking about. You can see here we've got two setups in two different beakers and they are connected both by this wire here and by this little contraption that we call a salt bridge. In this beaker, we've got the oxidation half of the reaction happening. We can see that our zinc metal is turning into zinc ions with a positive charge. So that's oxidation. Here in this other beaker, we've got the reduction half reaction where copper ions are being reduced to copper metal. And in order for that to happen, electrons have to move from one beaker to the other. The electrons have to leave the uh, zinc and move over to the copper. This metal, the metal that's being oxidized, we call the anode. We can remember that because we can have an ox. The thing being oxidized is the anode. The thing being reduced is the cathode. We remember that because we can also have a red cat. So the thing being reduced is the cathode. The electrons always move from the anode to the cathode. They always move in that direction. We remember that by fat cat. Fat standing for from anode two, and then cat being the cathode, from anode to cathode. So we could switch the order of these beakers. We could have put the reduction half in this first beaker, and then the electrons would have gone in the opposite direction, but they're always going to go from the anode to the cathode. I put this diagram in here twice just to give us some room to sort of look at some other things. We want to look at these reactions. Right here, we've got a metal going to an ion, and that ion is dissolved. So if we think about what's happening to this metal, this metal is going to lose mass. In other words, little bits of this metal are going to end up becoming ions and dissolving into the solution. And when we look at the zinc anode, we can see that that happens. It starts to corrode over time and the mass gets less and less. But if we take a minute to look at the reduction half of this reaction, we can see we've got a metal ion here. So maybe I should call that a cation forming a metal. Remember that this cation is dissolved and this metal would be a solid. So we've got the opposite thing happening here. We've got these copper ions whoop, becoming copper metal. They end up depositing on that metal. And notice that here we get that increase in mass. So this metal is going to increase in mass. 
Here's another reason we call this a fat cathode, a fat cat, because that cathode gets bigger. It gains mass. Of course, the mass is coming from the solution. So overall, we don't have a change in mass, but we have mass that used to be in the solution attaching itself to the cathode and then vice versa. We have mass that used to be on the anode uh, becoming ions and dissolving into the solution. Let's define some of these parts of the galvanic cell and be really clear about what we're talking about and what's happening. When we're talking about the anode, this is where oxidation occurs, which is why we set, remember anox. We end up having some sort of metal solid forming a metal ion that gets dissolved in water. The anode loses electrons and it loses mass. But remember that mass ends up in the solution. The cathode, on the other hand, this is where reduction occurs. We remember that red cat. We end up with an increase in mass. And that mass is coming from the solution because we have the opposite reaction happening. We have a metal ion gaining electrons and becoming a metal solid and adhering to that cathode. So it also gains electrons. The salt bridge is very important. We noted that there was a salt bridge, but we didn't talk about what its function was. This is super important. We can't leave it out because without the salt bridge, the battery doesn't work. We use it to balance the charges in the solution. It's generally filled with some kind of auger or paste that contains um, a neutral salt. So in other words, a salt that is neither an acid nor a base. The easiest one to use, the one I recommend using if ever you get the option to choose your own is KNO3, potassium nitrate. That is because potassium and nitrate both does dissolve with everything. So there's no risk of you adding a ion that's going to end up reacting with the solution already there and causing some kind of problem. So uh, potassium nitrate is the most common. And if you have a choice, if they're asking you to choose the salt, I recommend strongly that you choose potassium nitrate. Electrons always flow from the anode to the cathode. We can remember this as fat cat. Remember our anode, here's where oxidation happens. Oxidation means that we lose electrons. Remember that cathode, this is where reduction happens. Reduction means we gain electrons. So that makes sense, right? We're gonna give up electrons from the anode and they're gonna end up in the cathode. We've also noted that we see a change in mass in each of those nodes. So the cathode gains mass because we're going from ion to metal. And the anode loses mass because we're going from metal to ion. So this metal is always part of the node. So in this case, the cathode. And the ion is always part of the solution. Here, the metal would be part of the anode the ion still part of the solution. So when we have that re, um, reaction happening with the cathode, the ion is becoming part of the cathode and vice versa for the anode, we have the metal becoming part of the solution because it turns into a cation. The other thing we didn't talk about is this voltmeter. We're gonna come back to it in just a minute.
One more quick note about the salt bridge. The salt bridge is there to balance the charges. Remember that. But how does it do that? In the cathode solution, remember that here our cations are moving out of solution and becoming part of the cathode. So we need to replace those cations. We get those from the salt bridge. So if we're using potassium nitrate, then the potassium ions will go into the cathode solution. So here, notice that here they're using sodium chloride in ACL, but those sodium ions are moving in to the cathode solution. In an anode solution, we end up adding cations. So we need to balance with anions to keep that charge the same. So again, we can get these anions from the salt bridge. If what we're using If what we're using is KNO3, this anion would end up moving If we're using this KNO3, this anion ends up moving into the anode solution. This is actually how the cathode and the anode get their name. The anion moves towards the anode and the cation from the salt bridge we're talking about moves towards the cathode. So that's how those anode, that anode and cathode get their name. It's because of the ion from the salt bridge that tends to move towards them. Salt bridges typically look like this, but they don't always have to. Sometimes they can look like this. Sometimes if you have those circular batteries, like a watch battery, this part right here is the salt bridge and we've got the ions moving into the anode and cathode that way. So this is the way we see um, a battery set up in a lab. But of course, when we have a battery in a device, it's going to look a little bit different. And so the salt bridge might also look a little bit different. All right, let's go back to that voltmeter. If we scroll up just a bit, we'll see that we have a voltmeter on these batteries, on these cells. It's the same picture over and over again. Every one of them has a voltmeter. That voltmeter is just telling us the amount of energy produced or electricity produced. So it's just a meter, it's just reading it for us, but it is important. Sometimes we will be asked to sketch either the whole cell or part of a cell. They'll start it and ask us to fill in the rest. So we're gonna do some practice with that. And we're gonna label all of these things, anodes, cathodes, the direction of the electron flow and the reduction in oxidation have reactions. Here they've given us the total reaction and we just need to draw the cell. It doesn't really matter which side you put the cathode and the anode on. What we need is a container for each of these metals. Notice we've got chromium and we've got copper. I'm going to put chromium here and copper here, but you might have switched them. It really doesn't matter. The other thing we always need is a salt bridge. And I'm going to put KNO3 in my salt bridge because that's what I always use. Now we have to sort of figure out what would be in each solution and what's happening. Since chromium metal is here, 
I know that the chromium ion is also going to be in my solution. Those things always go together. The metal and its own ion should always be in the same container. So here I've got copper in my second containers. Um, so I need to put the copper ion in that solution. Here I can look at this equation to see what's happening in each um, beaker. I'm starting with copper ions and going to copper metal. So that tells me that I'm going to be gaining six electrons to form copper atoms. So this is reduction, which tells me that this is the cathode because reduction happens at the cathode. Over here, I'm starting with chromium metal and it's becoming chromium ions. So this is oxidation, which tells me that this is the anode. I can, I also need to connect these two with a wire. It would have a voltmeter and I need to show the direction of the electron flow. So I know electrons are going to be moving along this wire, but what direction? It's always from anode to cathode. So it's going to be in this direction. Let's do this one more time. Again, we're gonna have two beakers set up. We're going to need a salt bridge. We're gonna have two metals. One's gonna be the cathode and one's gonna be the anode. One's going to have silver. One's going to have cobalt. And they're going to be connected by a wire. Remember that my silver metal is going to be placed in silver solution. So that's the ion I'm going to draw in. And the cobalt metal is going to be placed in cobalt solution. So that's the ion I'm going to draw in the solution. Now I'm going to figure out which side's the cathode and which side's the anode. I've got silver ions becoming silver metal. So that's a reduction. So that happens at the cathode. So this then is my cathode. That tells me that this cation is going to come in here, right? So I've got this potassium ion moving into that solution. I'm going to have these silver ions depositing a silver atoms on that cathode and my electrons always move from the anode to the cathode so that tells me that the electrons are going to move towards the cathode over here this must be my anode and that's because i've got cobalt metal turning into cobalt ions. So that's oxidation, which does happen at the anode. So here I'm going to have these cobalt uh, metal atoms turning into more cobalt ions, which means I'm going to need that anion to plop in here to counteract that charge.